Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk to you a little about how we've implemented AGVs in our facility. Uh, we are Continental Automotive in Texas. We are a high volume electronics manufacturer. We build mostly engine controllers, but also short range radar and some sensor systems for the automotive market. So when we looked around for AGVs, uh, we wanted to implement something to help with our material transport. We have a lot of material transport on our facility. And going to some of the things you've seen earlier uh, from other presentations, uh, we really wanted to keep it simple. So first, we obviously thought about stockroom delivery, right? Then when we looked at it, we have a lot of different parts, uh, a lot of different things that need to come out of the stockroom, uh, transport across, uh, we almost like an airlock environment. It's a two-stage system to keep the stockroom in the stockroom and the floor clean because uh, it's a class eight system clean room. Uh, and so we looked around our manufacturing floor and we said, well, we decoupled our central packing operation a while back. And so that means that in manufacturing, we start out as a bare panel, we build it through SMD, we build it through back end assembly and a housing, and then we take it to another part of the facility in order to actually pack it and ship it in a box. To do that, we transport a large number of units in racks. So we said, we can move our racks. We thought about the Amazon Kiva style system. They bought the company, so we couldn't buy those. Uh, so we started looking around and uh, we found there are several competitors in this space out there. And I'll say there's three main types of AGVs, or I least like to think of them in three types. You have uh, what I'll call our smaller form factor AGVs. They're ten, typically 100 kilogram or less kind of payload. You have your medium size, uh, more like your truck or your SUV. Uh, that's more what we needed. The racks that we're moving weigh about 600 pounds. So think 280 kilos. Uh, when you're moving that much mass, you want to go a little slower. You need to be able to stop very quickly uh, because it's autonomous driving. And above that, there are even larger AGVs. Uh, one of our facilities overseas actually has robotic fork trucks uh, that can move pallets of material, uh, much like uh, what you just saw with auto, that weigh you know, several thousand pounds. Uh, those are going to be an even heavier mover. So knowing that we wanted to move our racks and we didn't want to invest in all kinds of new systems for that beyond the AGV, uh, we were looking for one that would actually pick up our racks, much similar again to thinking how the Amazon Kiva robot does. And the Athon Tug uh, does allow us to do that. So I'll show you a brief video and I'll kind of talk you through it. This was made uh, internally when we did our first implementation of the tugs. Uh, so it's a little bit of an intro, uh, but you'll see the tug actually working in our factory. Uh, what we do is we create a pickup and a drop off zone uh, for the tug. Vehicle traffic in our factory, we tend to limit to walking speed uh, and that's just for safety. Here you can see it fully loaded. It's picked the rack up off the floor. The wheels are not actually moving on that rack. They're just for when the rack is not on the tug and people need to move it around. In the background, you saw that orange tugger. That's how we previously moved racks. We would chain them together, tow them up and down, and occasionally push them down the factory. Uh, what it's moving from one end to the plant to the other is about 600 linear feet. So it's quite a bit of motion. Uh, and I'll show you in a little bit how many racks uh, the tugs have been moving and the distance, but you can see it's pacing uh, those two individuals walking. Collision avoidance was something we were worried about, right? We do have a lot of pedestrian traffic. You mentioned a clean environment uh, in the previous one. So we asked these two people to stand in the middle of the hallway. Uh, we don't encourage that generally, but the tug will actually detect them and drive around them. And as they move, you'll see it pause here in a moment uh, because it sensed them moving. Once it sees that they're not gonna move, it'll continue on its way. So it has very good collision avoidance. Uh, it gives a lot of space around it. Uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, these were originally designed for a hospital environment, so they definitely give a lot of space uh, to people. Here you'll see it coming to a, dr a drop-off location. It's going to drive into its zone, and if you watch closely, you'll watch the elevator come down. It'll place that rack on the ground, and then it'll drive out uh, so that it can go fetch another rack. So. They have a very interesting wheel mechanism. Tim can talk to you more about the, the technical aspects of how they work, uh, but they very much glide uh, around the factory. And so you'll see it can almost make a direct sideways movement. It doesn't actually have to turn uh, in order to turn and move sideways. And then it will slide under, it'll pick it up, and it'll take that rack somewhere else. So this is a, a basic layout of our factory. Uh, it's about 340,000 square feet, so there's a lot of movement. Stockroom and finished goods are kind of on one end of the factory, uh, and materials moves on another. We identified two phases in this project. In phase one, we wanted to move our racks, something very simple to start with. 
Later, we want to start moving material from, finish, uh, from stock room to the floor. To do that, again, we'll start simple, and that'll be our phase two, where we move our raw material, our SMD material, small, lightweight reels, in a similar style racking to the front of the factory. So today, we follow this purple line. Uh, the two stars that you see with a bunch of equipment, kind of on the, toward the bottom of the screen, but at the top, are the pickup zones, and they drop off to the packing area in the back. We've implemented in our two highest volume production areas, and we are rolling it out uh, to more production areas, uh, basically on a volume-based uh, order. The green line we'll be implementing later this quarter, and that'll be where we're actually taking tug across our factory in our main material aisles uh, and dropping material on the other side of the plant, reducing the amount of transport that people have to do in our factory. This was our projection. We had to turn our presentations in uh, a few weeks back, uh, so uh, I'll give you some updated numbers. But in April, the four tugs that we have actually moved over 17,000 racks in our facility, back and forth, dropping off material and bringing empty racks back into production. And they moved right about 1,800 kilometers. So if you think about that, and the ramp function that you see really has to do with the deployment of the, us modifying all of our racks and getting them in place so that it could actually engage with them and pick them up. Uh, but if you think about it, that's a lot of transport. Uh, and to put this in perspective, we had basically two people per shift, and we're a four-shift operation, who were transporting this material as the bulk of their job. They do some other things within the line, but that's basically it. Well, now that Tug's doing it, they can go do more critical thinking tasks, more difficult things that are better suited for people, and the Tug can basically take care of the transport. So it's been a very good time saver. So where we're at, our two highest volume customers are implemented. Uh, we are adding the rest of those products. We plan to be done toward the end of Q2. From a raw material perspective, we plan to start that later in Q2. That'll be our SMD material that I spoke about. And I mentioned our eight heads that we, uh, we were able to free to go do some more value-added work in the building. Our automated pick signals is really our next step. And so uh, the Uber example that was given in the last talk is a, is a good explanation of this. What we're going to do is deploy a sensor net of simple sensors in the factory that detect when a rack is placed in a pickup or in a drop-off location. Um, those will then interface to the fleet management software that Athon provides via their web interface. And so our PLC that monitors those sensors can programmatically effectively call a tug. Uh, and that way, instead of tug running on a schedule or running when someone manually calls it, they can get a pick list of tugs and have a more efficient distribution system. So he'll effectively get a large pick of places he needs to go, people he needs to pick up if he was an Uber driver, if you carry that example. Uh, he'll execute those picks and, and be able to optimize based on where our tugs are uh, so we can get even better utilization out of those. So we did have some initial concerns and challenges, and a question we get a lot is how do people feel about the tugs? So as with any new automation, there is always that period of time when people are a little apprehensive, uh, but acceptance at this point is very high. Uh, one of the things we did when we were doing pilot runs and everything else, we would talk to our people and we would encourage them to jump out in front of the tug uh, because they all wanted to do it anyway, so we just told them it was okay. So people would jump out in front of the tug and it stops. And once they see that when they jump out in front of the tug and it stops, they feel a little better about it. Uh, and now they've gotten away from that, thankfully, but when we have visitors, it's still a very popular game, uh, as is, how close can I get to Tug before he'll stop? Uh, and so we have people that try to sneak up on him. He has never hit anybody. Uh, so they're very good and very uh, cautious around people. We've also uh, done things when we had tour groups and we'll send uh, a large group of people, 10 or 20 people, just kind of as um, if they were cones in the aisleway. And it may take him a little while, but he will actually navigate uh, right through everyone uh, and find his way and pick a path uh, through. Some of the IT challenges we had, uh, they do, the fleet manager uh, sits in your data center, uh, so we needed to improve our Wi-Fi network on the manufacturing floor. Uh, we've invested more in our Wi-Fi, we adjusted our uh, access points, we had to make changes to how our, all of those access points talk together to get a stronger mesh network uh, and map all that. We were able to resolve those issues, uh, and now it doesn't lose connectivity uh, as it's walking around. Because while it uses odometry and other systems to know where it is, it does like to talk back to the fleet manager to make sure that it's in the right place and that it knows what's going on and doing the right thing. One of the other nice things about it is they have a remote data center support. So we had to build a firewall uh, between our data center and their data center. Whenever Tug gets into a situation that it doesn't know what to do and it kind of blocked or stopped and it's been sitting there for a while, it'll actually call home uh, to the vendor and they can remotely take control of it and get it to a safe location, run, run remote diagnostics and do other things. 
uh, that's very helpful. Uh, we are working on bringing our competency and our technician competency up higher, uh, but it's nice to have that safety net there, especially while we are still new to this technology. Um, expansion, that's the other thing we learned. So the racks, uh, we use our same rack, but we have to put them on a base that's compatible with the Athon tug so that it can engage and pick them up. Those have about a 12-week lead time. So we learned we need to keep those in, uh, in a Kanban style in order that we can have those ready whenever we decide we want to go make another deployment. So we are working on setting up those Kanbans so we can do that a little more quickly. And that is basically our autonomous robots. All right.